You know, we've been taking a look at uh, different prayers on Wednesday night, and we'll continue to do that for a while. And uh, tonight we're going to take a little different road. We're going to look at a prayer, but all the ones we've been talking about up to this point are types of prayers that we ought to pray. The kind of prayer that we ought to come before God and, and submit to Him, the kind of prayers that God would have us to pray that, uh, you know, that will honor Him. So tonight, I'm going to look at a rebellious prayer. Tonight, we're going to look at a prayer that we ought not be praying. A prayer that, in all honesty, ought to be a prayer that we should never pray. And it's in Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4. Now, we'll probably discuss uh, another prayer of Jonah here sometime soon. Maybe next week. I'm not quite sure. I haven't decided. Um, uh, and and that would be a, the prayer that he prayed out of the belly of the great fish. And in so doing, amazingly, in this particular prayer, his tone changes uh, now that God spared his life when he was in the belly of the fish, he prayed for his life to be spared. God spared his life and he was willing to do what God had called him to do. And so what we find is now he is praying a prayer after the fact. All right. That has already taken place. Now, let me go back and just kind of make sure we get a grip on understanding on what's taking place. Jonah was a prophet to northern Israel, to not to Judah, but to Israel. He was a prophet to Israel, and it was probably during the time of Jeroboam II. Now, Jeroboam II was a wicked king, but here is the deal with Jeroboam II, is even though the nation seemed to enjoy a time of relative peace and prosperity, they weren't being beat up by the nations around them, and quite frankly, the people were very prosperous. Jeroboam II reigned for a long time, and both Syria and Assyria both were actually at a place where they were not yet those great powers. They were building up to that, but they weren't there yet. And so they were building their strength and building their, uh, their, their armies, but they weren't where they needed to be yet. And so they weren't a nation to be worried about at this point in time. It just so happened that he reigned Israel in a time that there was really no threat around to come against him. All right. And uh, it allowed Jeroboam II to actually enlarge his borders, uh, the borders of Israel, so that they were as great as the days of, say, David and Solomon. He actually caused them to grow. If you were a person living in the nation of Israel <coughs> at that time, you'd be sitting back knowing that you were not serving God, knowing that the nation as a whole was was not being the people they ought to be. In fact, just the opposite of what God wanted them to be. They were serving false gods. But yet, the nation was prospering. If you were living in that nation, you might be going, oh, I don't know if uh, you know, we're prospering, we're doing well. It might not be that we have to serve God. God maybe has nothing to do with any of this. Here we are prospering, doing well, gaining ground, and uh, nobody's coming against us, and all is well. You know, we're at peace. And so they may have been looking at that and thinking those kinds of things. But here's the, the, the uh, dilemma. Just like uh, God tells the church of Laodicea, you think you're wealthy, you think you've got all these things, but in reality, you're poor. Even though they were strong physically and seemed as though secularly they had all the things <coughs> that they desired, spiritually, they were bankrupt. Spiritually, they were nowhere near what God would have them to be. It was a time of poverty in regard to spirituality. Their religion was ritualistic. It was increasingly idolatrous. And justice, even justice, had become perverted. Uh, peacetime and wealth had, make, had made them spiritually um, weak. I wonder if that's not what's happened to the United States, just for the record. I wonder if just our prosperity, how well we've done over the course of our time and uh, over, you know, the years that we, we all have lived, how things have went well and, and productive. And I wonder if that's not detrimental to who we are spiritually. You know, when we came out of times of depression, uh, it seemed like there was a great revival among the churches. But it's times of prosperity that seems as though... Um, People fall the opposite direction. Look at what we have done so we don't need God. And that's the picture that we find 
here. So peacetime and wealth had made them very bankrupt spiritually. Uh, it had affected their morality. It had af affected them and their ethics and how they conducted business, how they cared for one another. It had, it had taken its toll on them spiritually. And so that's, that's where they're at. All right. And by the way, simply because a nation is at peace and has prospered financially, it does not make it blessed of God. And that same thing holds true to churches. You, you see these guys preaching all this prosperity doctrine. Simply because a church is, is prosperous doesn't mean it's where God can use them. Doesn't mean that they're blessed of God. They might be blessed of the world. All right? And by the way, Satan can bless too. You know, Satan can give things. And, and it's deceptive because you think these things are wonderful and great, but they're temporal. And in, in light of eternity, they mean nothing. All right. So the same is true of churches, as I said. Uh, money, crowds are not the earmark of God's blessing. It's faithfulness. It's truth. It's where God's word is placed in the hearts and lives of people. These are the earmarks of God's blessings. And I think that's important that we understand that. Now, God might bless us with these other things, but those are not necessarily indications that God is blessed. All right. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria and was infamous for its cruelty. I mean, if they decided if they did have war with you and they took you captive, they were infamous for, you know, doing horrible things that were torturous for people. Um, and they were also historical, uh, historically a nemesis of Israel and Judah. In fact, it would ultimately be Assyria that takes Israel captive. All right. It would be Babylon that takes Judah, but it was Assyria that took them captive. And due to their growing power, their wickedness, here's what God had determined. God had determined that he was going to use Assyria to come against Israel and to um, enact his wrath against them. All right. And use, um, use Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, use Assyria to do that. Well, Jonah was aware of these things. And so God said, listen, I need you to go to Assyria. I need you to go to Nineveh and I want you to preach. All right. And if they don't repent, uh, if they don't repent, repent, then I'm going to destroy them. But if they do repent, I'm going to spare them. Now, here's the dilemma. If he destroys them, Israel has no one to fear. Assyria is the one they fear. All right, they're growing in strength. They've not gotten there yet, but they will. And, uh, and so, you know, if they repent and live, ultimately God's going to use them to destroy Israel. So if they repent, that means the wrath of God's going to fall on Israel. Well, Jonah's going, I don't want that to happen. I don't want to see, they're my dire enemy. I do not want to see them come to know Jesus Christ. I don't want that, all right, in our perspective, all right. In their day, it was just repenting of their sins and understanding and knowing who God was. But Jonah was called of God to go to Nineveh, preach this truth, but his hatred for them was so great that he was willing to disobey God. And he jumped on a boat, you know the story. He's going to head over to Tarsus and, um, and midway through there, you know, the storms come up and they find out he's the reason the storms are coming up. And the boat's going to sink. They throw him overboard and God causes him to get swallowed up by a big fish. New Testament says a whale. We're not getting into all that tonight. Um, but nonetheless, what happens is, is he repents in the whale's belly and he spewed up on land. He makes his way to Nineveh. Yes, sir. All right. So what we find is he goes to Nineveh. And at Nineveh, he does exactly what God said, much to his reluctance. Yeah. All right. Kicking and screaming, if you would. And he goes there kicking and screaming, but he preaches what God told him to preach. Yes, and uh, much to his frustration, the people of Assyria, even though his heart wasn't in it, even though I'm sure he didn't preach it in the conviction that he should have preached it, God prepared their hearts and God dealt with their hearts and lives. And in spite of Jonah, yeah. the nation or the city of Nineveh turned unto God, repented and uh, repented in sackcloth and ashes and God forgave them. Uh, boy, that's a tough thing. You know, Jonah's prayer was a disobedient prayer here at the end. He gets mad about all of this and he goes off and prays. His prayer that we're going to talk about tonight is that prayer where he goes off and prays. All right. It's a disobedient prayer. Yeah. Uh, but understand that, you know, that God dealt with this and that it only served to increase 
uh, the persecution on Israel, and, and Jonah hated that, hated the people he was preaching to. And though they repent, through their repentance, God did not destroy them. They ultimately captured the northern tribes. Jonah's preaching made that possible. The very thing Jonah did not want to do, did not want to happen, happened. But he trusted and knew the kind of God that he served and knew that God was merciful. And he feared preaching that message for fear that they would be saved. Imagine this for just a moment. And imagine an individual came to you, came to your family, broke into your home. Guys raped your wife, raped your children. And they find him and they punish him. They put him in jail. Imagine the hatred you're going to have for this guy. And God lays it on your heart to go preach the gospel to him that he might be saved. How hard would it be for you to go preach the gospel to this guy? How hard would it be to share with this guy the gospel of Jesus Christ when you hate him that much? It would almost be a situation to where I wouldn't want him to be saved because I'd like to see him die and go to hell. It might be to that point. I don't know. I've not been in that situation, but I'm just saying, I don't know what my heart would be, but it might would be of such. I'd like to think it wouldn't, but I'm just saying. And if, if he trusted Christ and, and became faithful to the Lord, I almost think that it would anger me. Because that's not what I want to see in him. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'd really rather see him put to death, see him go, see him done. Maybe. This is where Jonah's at. Hates this nation. Because he knows if they're revived, they're going to destroy Israel. All right? Now I want you to notice some things. First, let's just take a look at this prayer. All right. He knew the Lord was gracious and that this could happen. Uh, we know that just basically because of what he says. We're in chapter four. Uh, I forget what verse. Uh, I didn't mark down what verse. Verse uh, two. All right. Two and three. All right. Let me just read that. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore, I fled. What he's saying is, was this, isn't this what I said would happen? You're a merciful God, and I knew that if I went and preached to them, they'd get saved. I, I told you that's what would happen, all right? Therefore, I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and a merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repentance thee of the evil. I knew what kind of God you were. I knew you'd do that. Yep. Amen. That's why I was reluctant to do it. That's why I ran the other way, because I did not want that to happen. Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. I don't want to live knowing that I am the reason that they are going to destroy Israel. All because I came, preached to them, they repented, and now because of that, Israel is going to be destroyed and taken captive, and I'm to blame. I'd rather die. I just, God, I'd rather die. This is a prayer. God, just take my life. I'm done. I'd rather die than to be the cause of this. For I knew, this is why, this is, this is what he knew. I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness and repentance, uh, repentest thee of the evil. Now, I've shared this before, but I'm going to share it again just because it bears repeating. Uh, there was an incident, Ron Baker and I, one time, we uh, went on visitation, and we, he was my visitation partner. He and I went out all the time. And we were on a, a visit. And this, uh, we were visiting a friend of mine. And he hadn't got home from work yet. We were sharing Christ with his wife, who I knew very well also. And we began to share Christ. And she just began weeping. Just weeping. She began weeping so greatly that she actually got down on her knees on the floor and couldn't get up. She was just crying and weeping. Her name was Sue. I said, Sue. I said, wouldn't you like to trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior right now? And she says, no, 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 no. I said, Sue, do you, do you believe that if you, you ask him into your life that he, that he would save you? Yes, I do. Sue, do you believe that if you would repent of your sins and trust that Jesus Christ died for your sins, that you could have eternal life? I believe that. Then Sue, why don't you trust him? She said, listen to this. Because I know he'll change my life, and I don't want to change. Ron Baker and I walked out of that house that night 
with her not receiving Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior, not because she didn't believe he would, but because she didn't want the results of what would take place. She liked living the life that she lived. Now, I say that to say this, that we look at this and she knew what God could do and didn't want anything to do with it. Jonah knew what God could do. Jonah was convinced, if I go in there and I preach, God can change those lives. I know that I know what kind of God I serve. I know what kind of God I serve. And so if I go there preaching, he might change their life. Jonah knew the kind of God, for I knew that thou art a gracious God. I'm going to ask you a question. How convinced are we of what God can do? Are we so convinced that we know that if we share the gospel of Jesus Christ, if we share his word with somebody, the Bible tells us his word's not going to return void. Are we so convinced of that that we make every opportunity and every, every occasion we can just to share God's word because we know without a shadow of a doubt it won't return void? Here's the shame of it. Many of us don't. How many times have you not shared the Bible when you know you should have? Is it because we don't believe it or change hearts and lives? We know people that are lost. We all probably know people that are lost that we have never shared the gospel with. And my, answer, my question would be, why? Do we not believe that God can change their life? Jonah believed it so greatly that he knew God might change the lives of these people that he hated. So he ran and would not share the gospel, didn't want to share the gospel, because he believed so greatly that God could change their life. Now, I wish I had, I wish I had just half of that faith, in all honesty, just half of that conviction to believe so greatly that, listen, if I just tell somebody about Jesus, that God can change their life. If I just tell them God can change their life. I wonder if we're not convinced enough of that. He was so convinced that he ran because he did not want these people to be saved. All right. Um, I remember going out door knocking um, and sharing the gospel with the lost. And, and I'm, I'm thinking about it. And I'm thinking, you know, as I go and do that and I think about the kind of things I'm thinking, oftentimes I'm knocking on the door wondering why I'm standing there. And, and instead of going, you know, I hope these people are home because I want to share the gospel because I believe that God can change your life. Is that what's going through my mind? It ought to be. It isn't all the time. I'm not going to pretend like. That's what goes through my mind. But I'm just telling you, that's what ought to be going through our, our minds. You know, when we first began bus ministry, we had a little bit of a confrontation here in the church with some of our older members. And uh, they were of a, an ilk that did not want and desire bus ministry because their concern was this. They were afraid that we were going to bring in some undesirable people. And if we brought in undesirable people through our church, our bus ministry, it might turn other people away. And we surely don't want to turn the other people away. And, and I had to deal with that. And, and I did. We confronted it. I mean, it was a, a major confrontation. It wasn't just a little one. It was major, you know, where we basically said, listen, God called us to reach people for Jesus Christ. I don't make a determination of whether or not they're desirable or undesirable. We need to tell people about Jesus. People. Period. If it runs other people off, so be it. We're going to tell people about Jesus and we're going to do anything and everything we can to do what we can to, to do that. And I think God has blessed that. We now have four vans all right, that we run on a regular basis. Uh, Wednesday nights. How many did you guys bring in tonight? 33. Long way from nothing. Long way from nothing. And so, you know, when you think about all the people we've impacted over the course of the time and years... I, I got to tell you, I'm glad we did what we did, but it's because we believed that God could do something. Here was someone who was concerned that we were going to bring in undesirables because he believed that God might bring them in. And whether he realized it or not, he was exercising probably more faith, more faith than us, you know, um, in recognizing and knowing what God could do. You know, when missionaries go to various lands to share the gospel, I would imagine they do so expecting to turn the, that land upside down. I've yet to hear a missionary come in here and say, we don't really expect to win anybody to Jesus, but we're going. I never have heard anybody say that. Every one of them that come in here have high expectations of being able to start churches and see people come to know Christ. They're excited about the ministry, excited about the work. If they weren't, 
I wouldn't want to support them. You know, we want to see that. What we find is the question is, I guess, how convinced are we that God will, will change people's hearts and lives if we'll just share, share with them, if we'll just tell them, if we'll just preach the gospel, all right? Jonah knew what God would do, how he could do, and he just didn't want to see him do it. Um, Adoniram Judson, Adoniram Judson, um, was uh, the, the great missionary that went to Burma. Um, took him a long time before anything happened, but once it did, it just really took off. But it took forever. But I don't think he went to Burma thinking that God could do nothing. I don't think William Carey went to India thinking God could do nothing. By the way, I've had personal conversations with the Chellies, and uh, you know, they're, they're kind of a direct reflection of William Carey. Uh, in the ministry and in the work that they do. What a credible thing. Uh, Jonah fled from Nineveh initially because he knew what God could do. All right, so I, I want to say, I, I want to be that convinced. And this is a rebellious prayer. It's a rebellious prayer because Jonah knew what God desired. He knew what God could do. He knew what God would likely do, but chose to rebel and ran the other direction. God drug him back, kicking and screaming, as I said. Um, he, he now regrets it. He now regrets it, and he wants to die. Now, I wish this had never happened, and I want to die. Now, I want you to stop and think for a minute. According to Jonah 4.11, uh, there were more than 120,000 people in Nineveh. Now, i got to tell you, Brother Tyrone, let me ask you a question. If you, uh, if you had an opportunity to go out on the street corner and preach to 120,000 people and every single solitary one of them repented of their sins and turned to God, wouldn't you think it was a revival meeting? Yes, I mean, I'd be excited. Yes, I'd think, wow, yes, I'd get excited when somebody, I sit down with just one person they trust Christ, I'd get excited. Imagine leading 120,000 people to Christ and being angry about it. My Lord. My Lord. I can't believe this happened. Just kill me, God. Just kill me. That's what he's saying. All right? So Jonah was praying this prayer. God, I hate what just took place. Jonah 4.11 says, Should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are more than six score thousand persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. He's saying there's more than, more than 120,000 people that don't know beans. And you're going to go there and you're going to preach the gospel to them. All right? And that's what happens. But my reaction, I think, if, if 120,000 people came to know Jesus Christ at a time we were, had an opportunity to preach to that many people and 120,000 got saved, i got to tell you, as a church, I, I, I would feel like, man, we're, we're there. We're there. You know, the biggest churches in America aren't that big. You know, a third of that. Biggest churches in America are, are a third of that. You know, so it's, it's crazy. But he's upset because they, they repented. Jonah knew that God desired to save the lost. Do we know that? So much so that we want to please God, so we want to get out there and see things happen. We have a clear statement in Scripture. 2 Peter 3, 9 says this, The Lord's not slack concerning His promise. You guys know this. As some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's what he says in Peter. All right? That's what Peter shares with us. And so Jonah knew that a long time before Peter. And, and he understood that, listen, it's God's desire to see them repent. So if I go there and preach to them, there's a good possibility they might repent. Oh, I don't want to go. I don't want that. That's Jonah. All right. He also knew God's mercy. Amen. You know, had he not been merciful to Israel? I mean, Jonah had to understand that. I mean, he's probably, he knows, he's got enough sense to realize. He's looking at Jeroboam the second. He's looking at Israel. He's looking at how wicked they are. And he's going, and God hasn't destroyed them yet. Man, I know God's mercy. There ain't no way God should be letting us live the way we're living right now. I cannot imagine that. I know God's mercy. Man, living in America, we know God's mercy, don't we? Yes, I, I sometimes, I'll be honest, I sometimes think about it and I think, I don't get it. I don't get it. Why does God tolerate us? Why does God let us go on? I really believe it's because of 
churches like you and I and people like you and I really do. God blessing us. But regardless, I look at the situation and, and here's Jonah looking at his own situation. He knows God's merciful. Um, you know, I mean, imagine, I mean, this is God's wife. Israel is called God's wife. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Guys, imagine your wife. One day you, you're sitting there at the house, you're watching a ball game on TV and your wife comes strolling in with another man. You say, what's up with that? So, well, I've decided I want this guy instead of you and he's going to live here in the home with us. And uh, you're going to have to sleep on the couch. He's going to sleep with me. And um, he and I are going to sit and share some time together. We're going to go out and eat. And we're going to do some things. In fact, we're just going to ignore the fact that you're here. We're going to act like you're not even around. We're going to sit over here on this chair and cuddle up together. And, uh, how, how would you feel? And if you were to say, oh, honey, that'd be okay. I know you're probably just going through something. Now, I got to tell you, that'd be pretty merciful, wouldn't it? The nation Israel was doing that. The nation Israel had brought in false gods. They were committing spiritual adultery right in the face of God. Right, right in the presence of God. Jonah knew what was going on. Jonah was no dummy. He was a, a prophet of God. He knew what was happening. And Jonah's going, listen, I know how merciful God is because I can look at my own people and know that. If I go to Nineveh and preach, I know God's going to be merciful. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, the last point I want you to see is this. Is Jonah's desire to die is actually a really selfish desire. Um, God's will is that we serve him until he chooses to take us home. Until he chooses that. Um, Jonah's plea of basically, I quit. If I can't have it my way, I quit. Well, he's been disobedient all along anyway, so probably wouldn't make a whole lot of difference. But nonetheless, that was his idea. Listen, every, all this, I quit. All right? Um, as God's servant, he ought to be my Lord, and I'm obligated to follow his plan. I can't tell you the number of times I've talked to people who have said, God called me into the ministry, but my wife got angry about it and wouldn't let me go. And so I didn't go into the ministry because I wanted to save my marriage. It's like, seriously? Seriously? Now, I, I'm not one of those guys that, you know, you hear preachers say all the time that, you know, if, if God calls you into the ministry, he calls your wife too. I'm not one of those guys that believes that. I, I don't see it in scripture. But I think the wife needs to be a loving and obedient enough wife to follow you. And, and I think that. But by the same token, but by the same token, I, I'll just tell you now, how can, how can we disobey God? Just stand to God. We have to find a way. We have to find a way and trust that God's going to change your heart. Trust that God's going to do something in life. God can do that. That's who God is. God can do that. All right. Jonah cared, Jonah cared very little about God's desire. God, just kill me. I don't care what you want. He hasn't cared what God wanted all along. Why does this make a difference? Just kill me. I should have just died in the whale's belly. Just kill me. Yeah, yeah. Just be done with me. All right? Because I do not want to be that guy. Everybody's going to be mad at me. All my friends are going to be mad because I'm the guy that's going to be responsible for you sparing their life so that they ultimately come and destroy Israel. All right? So what we want to do is not be like that. Amen. God, use me till the day I die. Even if, even if it's a problem among my family and friends, even if it's something they don't want to see, they don't want to hear, even if it's a situation where, you know what, they, they just don't want anything to do with the God, I need to please you. It's most important that I please you. We need to be more like Paul rather than Jonah in this. We're here all the way to the end. He says, I fought a good fight, finished the course, I kept the faith. May it be said of each and every one of us, not that we went down kicking and screaming, God, I'm so angry about, you know, what took place and what's done, just kill me. I'm worthless, I quit. But instead, let us be people that, that keep the faith, finish the course, have a good fight, and all those things. Let us be that people, that person. All right? Any questions? All right. Are you enjoying going through these prayers? I, I am. I, I'm having a fun time studying them. I don't know. I hope you enjoy listening to them. I don't know. All right. All right. You guys, let's pray and we'll dismiss. Dear Father, Lord, thank you for all that are out tonight. We pray, Lord, that uh, you'll watch over us, keep us safe on our, uh, as we go home. Uh, Lord, give us a good night's rest. Help us to be about your business tomorrow. Give us a heart. Give us a passion to do what you've called us to do. Lord, no matter what, 
Don't let anyone or anything get in our way. But Lord God, let us want and desire to please you. Let us not be selfish about what we do. But Lord, let us be faithful to follow your will. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.